Ah. Thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you in, uh, in Copenhagen. My apologies, I do not speak Danish. Um, there are not many Danish lessons available in New Zealand, where I come from. And uh, so I have to speak English, but uh, more than that, I have to speak English in a very strange accent. <laughs> so my double apologies. Now, this, today uh, I'm going to talk to... I have my slides here in English because they said they're in Danish and I would not be able to recognise my slides. <laughs> so, <laughs> very challenging. So I have them here. Now, I am giving uh, today a talk about peer support and international overview. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, organised peer support... Uh, you know, when I talk about spontaneous peer support, that's what happened when we were in the hospital, when we made friends with people, when we helped each other out in the middle of the night because the nurses were too busy knitting in the, in the lounge. OK. So, funded or unfunded, we can have volunteers or paid staff or both. Now, it, um, the early peer support was run in... Um, in independent, peer-run organisations. But now, more and more, uh, mainstream organisations, traditional psychiatry, is saying, we want to employ peer support workers. Uh, so it can be in both. It can include um, user-run initiatives that have additional goals, uh, say advocacy or small business, that can have a very large component of peer support. There are many types of peer support services. Uh, and uh, in New Zealand, for instance, we have crisis houses that are run by peer support workers. Um, we have recovery education that is run by peer support workers. Um, we have ad peer run advocacy services. And there are examples of all these different types of peer-run services throughout the world. But really, it is not about, it is not really so much about what we do as peer support uh, workers. Um, it is about who, the who and the how. See, the what refers to the types of services and supports we may provide to our peers, and we can provide just about anything. But the who must be people with lived experience of madness or mental distress, and the how has to be guided by the values and practices of peer support. And as I will show you soon, the values are very much based on the, the, the things we um, experienced in traditional psychiatry that we did not like. Uh, next slide. Oh, I don't know what that says. <laughs> I hope it's the right one. <laughs> now, the values, they are very, very important to peer support. Many people, many uh, occupations, they go about their work they don't even ask what their values are. Um, but values are very important. They're more interested in, e than, in evidence than values. But we are more interested in values. We are interested in evidence as well, but values are very important. Now, the first value in peer support, self-determination. That is the right to direct our own lives. We talk then about participation. Uh, and equality, and that is the right to direct our own services. Um, mutuality or reciprocity is another value, and that's about having equal give and take relationships, because in traditional psychiatry, we were always the ones who did the taking, and we never were seen as being able to give, and that is very bad for human beings. Experiential knowledge, that is the knowledge from my lived experience, not necessarily from a book, 
or a diagnostic manual, but from my own experience. That is respected and valued and shared. And then we believe in recovery and hope that anyone can achieve the life that they want. Okay. And here are some images of, um, I understand those, they're, they're good. Um, some images of peer support, and you can see the values, are, um, the, you can see the values lived out in these images. Now, next slide. Um, some of the practices. In, uh, in peer support, this is a very new uh, a occupational group in mental health around the world. And at the moment, it is a canvas that has just started to be painted. And we need a lot more uh, people to come and help to paint the canvas. Do you understand? Um, but we do have some peer support uh, practices already. One is 12-step programs. Uh, they were developed in the 1930s for people with um, uh, drug and alcohol addictions. Now, they're not for everyone, but uh, some people have benefited from them. Uh, RAP, have you heard of Wellness Recovery Action Planning in Denmark by Mary Ellen Copeland? Yes, okay, that's another one. Who has heard of Intentional Peer Support here by Sherry Mead? Oh, you should get her to um, come to Denmark. <laughs> um, another one is Personal Assistance in Community Existence by um, a man called Dan Fisher in the US and his colleagues. One that we have developed in New Zealand is peer-led workshops um, called Peer Zone. Uh, there are hearing voices networks. Do you have hearing voices networks in Denmark? Yay, good. Um, but even some uh, methodologies, even some practices that weren't, um, that weren't developed by peers, if they are consistent with our values, they can also be useful. And some peer support workers, they use mindfulness. Do you know mindfulness? Yeah. Uh, and elements of uh, cognitive behaviour therapy might be useful, some peers might find that useful. Depends how it's done, of course. But we need further growth in all these practices, and there is a whole lot of work to be done in this area. Now, what kind of relationships do we have in uh, peer-run uh, peer services? And of course, um, uh, one of the key things about peer services is, is that we have mutuality. And some, uh, and some relationships are very mutual that we have, and other relationships are not very mutual at all. Now, with a traditional professional, it is very non-mutual, the relationship. Um, but with a friend, it is very mutual. Um, now, if I'm a member of a support group, well, it's nearly as mutual as a friend relationship, if I'm a peer volunteer or a paid peer worker, uh, it is still fairly mutual, uh, but being paid uh, does create some, um, uh, a little less mutuality. And of course, in the recovery literature, you see that recovery professionals, uh, they say, well, we need to become more mutual than the traditional professionals. I saw a book by... Elaine Topor uh, on the thing. I didn't. I, sorry, I didn't read the name, but I could understand the author. And he has talked a lot about how we need to become more mutual in uh, in um, a recovery if we're a recovery professional. Now, here is a quote from um, a, an Aboriginal uh, educator, uh, an Australian Aboriginal educator. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And this is really the essence of peer support. Right, 
Now, it, you, it is very interesting. Uh, peer support has very, very deep roots, very long roots in history. And um, going back to the 19th century, uh, but even before then, um, one of Philippe Pienel's um, uh, people working in his asylum, he, he once wrote to him in 18, uh, 1793, and he said to Philippe Pinel, um, we like to employ workers who have been patients because we find that they are more gentle and humane in this difficult work. Now, this is 1793. That is over 200 years ago. So nothing is new, as they say sometimes. But we have the alleged lunatic society in England, Alcoholics Anonymous, was another wave of peer support in the drug and alcohol field. But the peer support I'm talking about today really had its origins in the survivor movement from the 1970s on. Now, the difference between uh, the user survivor movement and Alcoholics Anonymous, they say, Alcoholics Anonymous say, we are not political, OK? but the user-survivor movement is political. We, we see that power relationships um, uh, are at the heart of how we uh, experience mental health services. And, um, equal, and we have to equalise power relationships in peer support services, but also we need to equalise them in the mental health system as a whole. Then uh, in mental health, I said in 1793 was the first reference we have to people with lived experience working with people. But in recent times, we've had a growth in community-based services in most countries. All these things have helped to prepare the ground for peer support. Do you have policy on service user participation in Denmark? Do you know what that means? Uh, you, I have the right language. Um, of course, it doesn't make much difference, but at least it's down on paper. Um, the recovery philosophy and policy. This has uh, helped to prepare the ground for peer support. And of course, the failure of current mental health treatments. Now, people, more and more people, even uh, people who run the mental health system, are starting to see that what we have been providing for people does not work very well. Uh, the drugs shorten people's lives. Uh, recovery rates have not, uh, in the West, have not increased since the 1880s. Um, they have not increased since the drug revolution of the 1950s. There are too many people who cannot get jobs. There are too many people who are living lonely lives, uh, who die young. And all these facts that we know now are suggesting that we need to find radically new alternatives to the way we treat people. Of course, uh, the people who run the system will not give up uh, what they already do, but the facts, are, the, the, the facts are getting stronger and stronger that what what this system does to people uh, does not work. So that is, that is a great uh, impetus that provides um, uh, some motivation for those of us uh, who, who understand these facts to create new alternatives. Next one. And uh, there are trends in uh, general health because uh, the people who run the health system uh, well, a hundred years ago, they were very worried about all these people dying from infectious diseases. Now they're worried about lifestyle-related diseases, uh, like diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And uh, they, they realise that if we have conditions, whatever that condition is, um, we have to self-manage. We have to learn to manage our conditions. And so... This is another lever we have when it comes to um, saying to the people who run the health system, well, 
Peer support is about us managing our lives and getting on with our lives. That fits with where you're going in health, where, where you are wanting people to manage their conditions. Uh, and I'll just miss the next slide. So we go on to, it's all about timing. Oh, yes, I see timing the same in Danish. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> now, is there much peer support going on in Denmark? Good, no, you said no, I asked you that question already, yeah. So, well, it is really taking off in many countries. In America, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Scotland, England, the Netherlands, um, in France, okay? All these countries and more, uh, that they are not only, uh, they are starting to say, we need to employ peer support workers. And I think that you are going through a planning, you are planning uh, new services in Denmark. Did the minister say there is a plan happening? Yeah? So, this is your opportunity to make sure that peer support is in your plan. Um, and uh, it, it is the fastest growing mental health occupation in, in most countries. Um, now, do you have uh, financial problems in Denmark at the moment? <laughs> well, you're not in the euro, so maybe that helps, I don't know. Uh, so, so, you can say to the politicians, well, you know, um, this peer support work, because we're cheaper than psychiatrists, peer support workers, and we get better outcomes. So, why don't you try it out, because uh, th then you will save money. Okay. Then, uh, then, then you can say, well, it doesn't matter whether the left wing is in or the right wing is in, they can all relate, they can all respond to peer support. The right wing, they say, um, uh, oh, self-reliance, oh, we like that. So we will, uh, we will support peer support work. And the left wing say, oh, make it, uh, giving people equal opportunities and citizen rights, oh, that's good, so we will put support peer support work. So you just uh, speak different language to whatever government is in power. It's easy. <laughs> Next one. You see, at the moment, um, what do we have in most countries? What services can everyone who comes into the mental health system get? Drugs and hospitals, pills and pillows. Now. I, d I never asked for pills and pillows, but I got them. So, so everyone gets pills, even when they don't want them, they get pills. Um, and, and, and we know that even in the USA, where there is more peer support than everyone else, e anywhere else, only 5% of people who use mental health services have access to peer support. So we have a long way to go to, so that we can uh, add peers to the pills and the pillows. So um, if we want to go to 99% access, there is a long way to go. Next slide. But there, although there is a lot of activity happening in uh, some other countries, um, you know, the, 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 uh, there are a lot of people being employed, but as I said, the canvas has not been painted yet. And so we need agreed definitions, we need standards, uh, funding streams for peer support workers, um, qualifications. This is controversial, but I believe we need qualifications and educational and career pathways. We need um, mainstream organisation culture change. I will talk a bit more about that in a minute. And we need the development of practices. Now. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about should we have peer support workers in their own independent organisations or in mainstream organisations? Um, I think we need both, uh, but there are many, many risks 
having peer support workers in traditional psychiatry organisations. And I think they really struggle to provide a supportive context. Next slide. Because if you think about mainstream or traditional psychiatry, who has the power? Well, it's not the users. It's not the clients. Uh, it, at the board level, at the worker level, or at the user level, uh, the users do not have the power. So, uh, it is very difficult then uh, for, for the organisation to create that supportive structure. Who has the knowledge? Well, professional knowledge dominates in uh, traditional psychiatry. And some, some uh, look down on their colleagues. I've seen this again and again. We get peer support workers into traditional services and they look down on their colleagues. Uh, to such a degree, they say, you can't come to our Christmas party and we don't want you uh, in, our, in our staff tea room, even as blatant as that. They feel better qualified. Ten minutes, good. And many, uh, they don't even understand what the peer role is all about. They think they are just sort of low-paid clinical workers. So, um, so many uh, mainstream organisations have employed peer workers to be um, servants to the clinical workers. The clinical workers say, oh, they do all these things we don't have time to do. They go out and visit people. They just, an, they just see they are an arm of the clinical workforce. And uh, that is a misunderstanding of peer support. And again, some of them, uh, they go out and they, for, the work, for the clinical workers, and they go to people's doors and they put medication in their hands and they watch them take their medication and they get peer support workers to do that. No. Then another thing they do is um, they get peer support workers to persuade people you must take your medication. That is a wrong use of peer support. In England, I heard someone say, oh, well, we got our peer support workers in the hospital to come and help put people into solitary confinement or seclusion. No, that is a total, because you think about the values I talked about, the values of peer support, we are against force, we are against uh, telling people what to do, being bossy. Um, we are for human rights, self-determination, equality, and people running their own lives. So this is why it is so difficult for peer workers in traditional psychiatry, and why our values need to be protected in that environment. Now, this is what it is like in, uh, for peers or people with lived experience who work in traditional psychiatry. This is uh, a, an Australian cartoonist. He's very good. He's, he's pretty mad himself. And um, you see these people in their suits and their briefcases. And uh, that is called a garden advisory service. But you could say, you, you could call that peer support service. And here they are trying to tend to their beautiful little garden and, all the, and they're being trampled over by all the big people in the suits and the brief, briefcases. Now, but there are some opportunities in traditional psychiatry to have peer support workers uh, in, inside the mainstream services. Well, we can influence culture change. That's one thing, although... I think asking the lowest status people to influence culture change is asking a lot of them, uh, but some people say this works. The growth of peer support is more likely if we uh, go into the mainstream mental health system than if we stay on the outside, because all the funding goes into the mainstream mental health system. And as I said, we want more and more people to have access to peer support. If we want uh, everyone who comes into services to have access to peer support, then we do need people in, the, in traditional psychiatry uh, inside it who are doing peer support 
as well as outside. But there are many threats as well. Um, you know, translating the values, as I said, is difficult because we have low job status and, and there's discrimination and job stress. And one of the things that clinical people do is they say, oh, well, peer support workers, they're just like us. And they don't see that there's a difference. And this is very, very difficult because there is a difference. But often, peers who don't have the proper background or the proper education just turn out to be little clinicians because they don't know of any other way. And I've got two more minutes, so I better get moving. Right. So we need profound culture change inside mental health services if we're going to have peer workers working in them. Profound culture change. Now, um, this is what the system is like at the moment. The, the clients are the round wheels and the, squi the, 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 the square wheels are trying to carry all the clients. Well, why don't we put the clients on the wheels? Why don't we make them the wheels? Now, the evidence for peer support. Look, there, are, there, there is a lot of evidence that has been uh, uh, collected on peer support over the last 15 years, mainly in the English-speaking world. Reduced distress and use of health services, improvements in practical outcomes like employment and housing, uh, better self-management, better uh, social support and quality of life, and uh, a better ability to communicate what you want with providers. And then in comparison to conventional services, we find the evidence says there are better or equal outcomes. There's always better satisfaction, almost universally. People like them better. Um, there is no evidence that peer support does harm, and um, um, no evidence uh, that, and that, you know, the there's still some um, debate about whether peer support in the independent uh, consumer-run organisations is more effective than peer support in mainstream psychiatry. Now, in case you're feeling uh, it's all a bit difficult, well, um, I don't know what the translation for... Uh, the, there's, an English, uh, there's an English saying, oh, it's like trying to go up shit creek without a paddle. Uh, so, but apparently there are paddle stalls for Ship Creek. I mean, I, I've never seen one. This is a joke. And now, I want to finish with a quote. Revolutions begin when the people who are defined as the problems achieve the power to redefine the problem. And that is what we are doing in peer support. Thank you very much. Oh. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary.